1943, I joined the SOE. I was a secret agent. I was determined to get rid of the, the Nazis. They had conquered the whole of Western Europe. The least you could do is try and stop it. I was organizing resistance groups and creating all the trouble for the occupying forces that we could. Every minute when you're a secret agent is dangerous. But it's exhilarating. And for a young fellow, 19, 20 years old, it's very stimulating. June 1940, the victorious German army marches into Paris, having crushed the peoples of Western Europe, who now unsure of their fate, are at the mercy of the Nazi conqueror. This is the Place de Trocadero in Paris. In June 1940, Adolf Hitler came to this exact spot to celebrate his conquest of France. It was the beginning of the darkest days in European history. In a short period of time, Hitler's armies had enslaved tens of millions of people, and their only hope of liberation would come from the other countries, the free countries. And amongst the first liberators were agents of the Special Operations Executive, the SOE. With the Nazi domination of Western Europe complete, Great Britain is desperate to strike back and creates a secret army, the SOE. Its mission, to organize Europe's scattered resistance groups and sabotage the German war machine, setting Europe ablaze. The SOE would bring the war to the Germans. Their main tactic, would be industrial sabotage, and their battleground would be the towns and villages and back streets like this one of France. Amongst the SOE agents were a handful of Canadians who chose, despite the deadly risks, to come to France to raise the spirit of resistance and to give hope to occupied Europe. The SOE recruits hundreds of volunteers, all willing to exchange their normal lives for the perilous life of a secret agent. One of the young men willing to take on this dangerous mission is a 19-year-old signalman from Saskatoon, Al Sirwa. When I joined the SOE, they warned me that it wasn't, it wasn't a piece of cake. You know, they said uh, it could be very dangerous. Well, I was prepared to take that chance because uh, it never crossed my mind that I wouldn't make it. The training consisted of five different schools. They sent me to northern Scotland and the Isle of Skye to do commander training for six weeks. You did exercises in unarmed combat. When that was completed, we went to Manchester for a parachute training. And it took, in, inside of a week, we were finished with that. One thing they told you, if your shoe doesn't open, say, never mind, it's no problem. Go to the quartermaster stores, they'll give you another one. And the final school was the School of Security. They taught us how to break into houses. They taught us how to uh, shadow people and throw people off you who are shadowing you. Coming out of there, we were in London ready to go. November 18th, 1942. The first Canadian agent is sent to Nazi-occupied France. 38 years old and a father of two. Montrealer Gustav Bieler proves in training to be extraordinarily calm, methodical, and coolly courageous. He quickly becomes a legend among the other agents, who will know him only as Guy. Bieler's mission is to set up a new resistance network codenamed Musician, near the northern French city of Saint-Quentin, 
a railway and canal transportation hub vital to the German war machine. Dressed as French laborers and armed only with pistols, Beeler and two other agents jump into the darkness over the Loire Valley region, an area occupied by thousands of German troops. Beeler crashes onto rocky ground, and now deep in enemy territory, he lies in agony, unable to walk, having shattered his spine. His fellow agents managed to smuggle Beeler to Paris, where hiding under a false identity and desperately dodging the Germans, he slowly recuperates. And although the SOE in London offers to bring him home, Guy stays on, determined to complete his mission. After Guy had recovered from his injuries, he came north to St. Quentin, where he met Eugene Cordelet, a very brave French resistant. Cordelet brought Guy here to Fonsom, in fact, to this house, where they would interview men and women who would form the musician's circuit. The interviews actually took place in the back garden. Guy and Cordelette set up in this backyard under a big tree, and Guy still needed a chair because his back was still giving him problems. And they interviewed men and women for the circuit. They had to be very careful who they picked. They had to find people who were trustworthy because collaboration with the Germans in 1943 was terrible. They had to pick people who understood the risks. If you got caught, you and your family could be shot. But they wanted people who were in, let's say, the railway industry, in the canals, maybe inside a German office, people who could help them with their planning of the sabotage. One of Guy's recruits is a 22-year-old farm laborer, Raymond Bazin, who joins a team that specializes in sabotaging the many railways around St. Quentin. Notre premier travail, c'était on les précédé, enfin, de, de peu, c'était d'isoler les gardes voies. Toute la voie d'un bout à l'autre, les Boches avaient fait garder la voie par des civils. On a tombé sur des situations focales, on a tombé sur quelquefois des anciens copains d'école. On les ficelait, enfin, quelquefois, ils se ficelaient même eux-mêmes. Il fallait déboulonner un rail et puis ripper le rail. Alors la locomotive, quand il arrivait, le bougie avant, il déraillait, il entraînait la locomotive, puis tout le train se couchait sur l'autre bout, on bougeait tout. C'était la grande fricassée, comme je disais. In a few short months, the musician network derails scores of trains and cuts dozens of railway lines. Guy Beeler has quickly become one of the most successful SOE organizers in France. One of the jobs of the organizer was to select targets for sabotage. Ideally, they would go after strategic industrial targets or ones with a maximum psychological effect. St. Quentin is a transport hub with large railways and industrial canals. And these industrial canals feed the war machine throughout France. And these presented a great opportunity for Guy and his friends. To protect these canals that carry vital supplies to their army and submarine bases in France, the Germans ensure the vital waterways are constantly patrolled. Well, the best way to affect traffic on the canal was to blow the locks. Guy decided, surely with planning from inside information, on when and how to attack these canal locks. One night, Guy and two other men, laying low in a rowboat, floated down the canal. They got to the lock gates and planted magnetic limpet mines along the sides of them. And a few minutes later, the gates were blown. 
and it was a fantastic success and it stopped canal traffic for six weeks. Outraged by constant resistance attacks, the Nazis hit back, determined to destroy the networks of the SOE. Heading the German attack is a chief of military counterintelligence in northern France, Lieutenant Colonel Hermann Giskes. These dynamic enemy forces, whose strength was growing, didn't hesitate to carry the war behind our lines in all conceivable forms. We had to stop this invisible and dangerous enemy. To penetrate and crush the resistance, the Germans will stop at nothing, easily resorting to torture and murder, as British SOE agent Yo Thomas discovers. Two Gestapo men took me to a small room on the fourth floor. My handcuffs were attached to a hook at the end of a long double chain, which hung from a pulley on the ceiling. The other end was pulled and my heels left the ground. The steel of the handcuffs dug deep into my wrists. Agony shot through my shoulders and I couldn't help groaning. Five new thugs came in. They threw me onto a table and fastened chains around my legs and my feet were spread out. Two men held down my arms. With rubber truncheons, the other three rained thudding blows on my face, legs, and body, concentrating on my testicles. I screamed until I fainted. The life of the spy was one of constant vigilance. In 1943, there were tens of thousands of German agents, collaborators, and informants throughout France, and they're looking for anything different. One of the main things that you had to watch for was language, or really accents, because every part of France has their own accent, so your language would automatically give you away. So you wanted to talk as little as possible. Then if you had a rendezvous, there was the security checks. If you had a meeting in an apartment, drapes closed, good, open, bad. If you had to meet another agent in the streets, there was the newspaper trick. In your pocket meant Bad, under your arm, meant good. To survive, you had to be lucky and you had to have nerves of steel. As the spring of 1943 draws to a close, thousands of Razy Stone are arrested, interrogated, and tortured as the Germans step up their campaign to crush the resistance in Europe and eliminate the agents of the SOE. Summer, 1943. On select airfields across England, Covert operations are underway. Desperate to resupply its secret army throughout Nazi-occupied Europe, the SOE organizes hundreds of clandestine drops. The organizer was responsible for the drops from England. He'd meet with a bunch of his friends and local farmers. They would pick out which field they thought was safe. And they would put together a shopping list of weapons, explosives, money, and of course, always some goodies for the boys, chocolate and butter in particular. They would then go and code it out and the wireless operator would send it to England. And then they would await response. This always came at 7 and 11 o'clock at night, and it was from BBC Radio. Voici notre huitième bulletin d'information au cours duquel vous entendrez quelques messages personnels. And it'd be something innocuous, 
something like the dog is on the roof. And that meant your circuit was going to have a drop that night. Gabi, mange ta soupe, ma chérie. Nous disons, Gabi, mange ta soupe, ma chérie. Les lions sont terribles. Nous disons, les lions sont terribles. Once the drop was on, the organizer would get half a dozen or a dozen men, depending on what he needed, to come to the area. And they mostly came out by bicycle because cars were too conspicuous. And they'd come here and they'd set up in the woods, waiting for the time to come, just passing time. As the time came for the plane, they would come out with three lights in a one line, 100 yards apart. The lead light would be red, followed by two white lights. And this is for the bomber to come in. We would see the red light to know which direction to drop the chutes. So at this point, they could hear the plane coming. These drops always took place around the full moon, so they could even see the silhouette of the plane, and it's only at about 500 feet. And of course, it would pass over, and the chutes would come out. On the night of June 15, 1943, the reception committee got more than supplies. They were to receive two Canadian agents, Frank Pickersgill and John McAllister. Frank Pickersgill was trapped in France when the Nazis invaded, but he managed to escape and make his way to Britain. With his adventurous experiences in occupied France, Frank is an ideal recruit for the SOE. I'm convinced that as far as this war is concerned, there are certain jobs I can do better than anybody but a handful of people, and surely that is the most suitable thing for me to do. But such jobs are dangerous is just one more thing in their favor. On June 15th, Frank Pickersgill and his radio operator John McAllister prepare to parachute deep into occupied France. Their mission is to establish a new network called Archdeacon to organize the sabotage of factories and munitions plants north of the city of Sedan. Landing undetected, the Canadians are met by two experienced French agents, Yvonne Rudelat, codenamed Jacqueline, and Pierre Cuglioli. Not realizing the area has been cordoned off by the Germans, the four begin the long drive north to Paris. And just outside the small village of Duisson, they run into an enemy checkpoint. Things went very well at the first checkpoint, and that wasn't unusual. But after a short distance, there was a second checkpoint, and that was unusual. Something was up. There weren't only German soldiers there, there were also SS and Gestapo. They came over to the car and asked Pickersgill and McAllister to get out and come with them. When they came across this square, there were dozens of German trucks. The Germans were swarming everywhere. The two were escorted up to the Marie. It was their first day on the job, and things were going very badly. When McAllister and Pickerskill got into the Marie, they found about a dozen other men being interrogated by the Gestapo. In the meantime, Pierre and Jacqueline had cleared through the checkpoints and had driven out in front of the Marie, and they didn't know what to do. If they waited too long and things went wrong, the four would be caught, and of course, they had the radios in the trunk of the car. If they left, then the Canadians were done. And all of a sudden, a German soldier comes out and says, come in for interrogation. Pierre decides to run for it, and the chase was on. As Pierre Cuglioli and Yvonne Rudelat roar away, the Germans riddle the car with bullets, and it plunges off the road. For the SOE, this is a catastrophe. Opening the trunk of the car, the Gestapo agents discover McAllister's radio, his secret codes, and the names of the leaders of Prosper, the major SOE network in Paris. The Gestapo moves quickly, and within days, many agents and resistants are in German hands. Hundreds more follow, destined for interrogation and torture. Frank Pickersgill and John McAllister, too, are tortured for days. But they refuse to talk. 
and finally no longer of any use to the Germans. They're transported to Ravitch concentration camp in Poland. But using McAllister's radio and his codes, German agents pose as the two Canadians and transmit messages to London. They fool the SOE into parachuting agents directly into the hands of the Gestapo, a ruse often employed by the Germans, known as the radio game. Playing this deadly game is Lieutenant Colonel Hermann Giskis. The operation known as playing back, or the radio game, consisted of continuing to work with a captured radio set in the service of our own counter-espionage, concealing the fact of capture from the enemy secret service and leaving it under the impression that its agent was still operating safely and undisturbed. The radio game is a coup for the Germans and a disaster for the SOE. All over France, Agents are captured, and networks collapse. Hardest hit of all is the Parisian network, codenamed Prosper. The collapse of Prosper was catastrophic to the SOE in Paris. In the summer of 1943, the Germans picked up 1,500 agents, and they were operating seven of the 10 wireless sets in the Paris area. One of the few wireless sets that was still operating belonged to a woman called Madeleine, or that was her code name. Her real name was Noor Inyat Khan. Agent Noor Inyat Khan narrowly escapes capture and warns the SOE that Prosper has been infiltrated. But fooled by the Germans' radio game, London replies that its agents in Paris are still broadcasting. Prosper must be intact. Regardless of her doubts, she was advised to meet the two Canadians, Pickersgill and McAllister, who under their code names Valentin and Bertrand, at the Café Colisse. And at that point, she would give them contacts to the circuits in the north. Thinking the two German agents are the Canadians, Noor Inyat Khan gives them details of her SOE contacts. Now the Gestapo has the information it needs to destroy the resistance in northern France, including Guy Bieler's network, Musician. the Germans have begun to infiltrate and gut its networks in Europe. The SOE continues to send in new agents. On September 17, 1943, a Lysander aircraft secretly lands on a field in Nazi-occupied France. On board is a 32-year-old SOE radio operator, Yolande Beekman, codenamed Mariette. Mariette, enfin, nous on l'appelait Mariette. Belle fille, c'est formidable. Tous les gars qui l'ont vu du réseau, il était amoureux fou d'elle. Mariette's mission is to join Guy Bieler and work as the radio operator for his musician network, transmitting Guy's messages direct to London from St. Quentin. This is the attic from which Yolande Beekman used to transmit to London. She used to come up here at regular intervals. She'd take her aerial and slide it down here and then she'd transmit the message her and Commandant Guy had agreed upon. They decide on maybe ordering a drop for some more explosive or some more Sten guns or some more money, anything to help the operation. Of course, the message would have to be coded and then ciphered with Yolande's specific security codes. The problem was that the Germans who were in the area could possibly pick up on this. And this meant disaster not only for Jan Beekman, but for the French resistant whose house this was, a very brave woman by the name of Mademoiselle Gabot. Despite the deadly risks, Odette Gobot continues to offer her home as a base for Yolande Beekman's radio broadcasts. Au début, il était en stationnement vraiment chez Odette. Elle était à la vitrine de Maison Cortel. Je vois passer une voiture euh, au ralenti, une voiture bochée. Et elle savait que c'était l'heure d'émission à Mariette. Alors elle a bondi 
traversé la route, elle avait juste la route à traverser. Elle, elle a coupé le courant, plus de courant, plus d'émissions. Alors la voiture gougnoua, qu'on fait un passage ou deux, puis après ça disparaît. Alors c'est là qu'on a trouvé que l'endroit était venu quand même dangereux. The Germans had direction-finding vehicles. They used to have cars or trucks, and they had mobile direction-finding equipment, and they'd drive around towns trying to pick up the wireless signal being transmitted. There were certain ways the radio operator could, could get rid of this. One, they couldn't operate more than 30 minutes. Secondly, they can move from place to place, and thirdly, they can change the band while they're transmitting. And these through the direction finders all over the place. And the only way that the SOE agent could really survive was to keep moving. Evading enemy patrols, Guy Beeler takes refuge on Christmas Eve in the house of a resistant, Madame Camille Bourri. Guy Billet arrived carrying two Santa Clauses stuffed with candy for our children, and under each arm, a few good bottles. We had arranged a good Christmas atmosphere with the traditional pine tree and candles. We listened to the BBC messages from London and then the wonderful Christmas music. Guy recited to us, as he could do so well, beautiful poetry. At midnight, Guy held his head in both his hands for a long time. When this silence was over, he was very serious and seemed completely overcome. He wrote on the back of one of our photographs an address. He then said to us, If misfortune overtakes me someday, write to this address. You will find my wife there. Tell her how I spent Christmas of 1943. Describe this evening to her. Tell her how I thought of them. As the new year, 1944, opens, there are few safe places left in northern France. Using information from collaborators and captured agents, the Germans are tightening the noose on Guy Beeler. These are the southern outskirts of St. Quentin, and it was here Commandant Guy and his operatives felt safe. They were amongst friends here, but by early 1944, no place was truly safe. The Germans had put so much pressure on that Yolande Beekman had to move her radio set and herself several times to avoid detection. On the evening of January 13, 1944, she spent the night here at the Café Le Moulin Brûlé in that room at the very end of the café. On the 14th, she had a meeting with Commandant Guy. The café had always been a safe place for Guy and Yolande. He had met here many times and here they would make their plans. And on January 14th, 1944, things appeared no different. They sat down at the table over coffee when two cars pulled out in front and a dozen Gestapo agents burst through the doors and grabbed them. They never had a chance. They were cuffed and dragged off to Gestapo headquarters. No one knows how the Germans found out about the rendezvous, whether it was good espionage or whether or not they had been betrayed. And over the next few days, the rest of Guy's circuit was rounded up. He said we were well sold because we can't sell anything, we know everything. We don't have to nier that we haven't participated, that we don't know anyone. He gave us a number of people. Il y a quelques-uns qui avaient parlé, peut-être sous la torture. Il y avait les procédés, la Gestapo, pour faire avouer qui n'était pas vraiment avouable, mais il y arrivait. Les Germans arrêtent dozens de membres de la Musician Network et les prennent à la Gestapo headquarters en Saint-Quentin. Among those captured is Guy Beeler's closest friend in France, Eugène Cordelette. The night we were arrested, I saw Guy in a corridor of the prison at saint Quentin. He was chained hand and foot. 
His face was horribly swollen, but I could read in his eyes this order. Whatever happens, don't talk. In spite of all torments, he showed no weakness. Spring 1944, with the Allied invasion of Europe only a few months away, the SOE steps up operations, determined to get more agents into occupied France to prepare for the coming liberation. One of the many agents dropped into enemy territory is a 19-year-old radio operator from Saskatoon, Al Sirwa. You, you were nervous about jumping into occupied territory. You, you have to admit you were. But uh, I said, no way. That's what I volunteered for, and that's what I'm going to do. That's it. Let's go. You had to watch the red light. The minute the light turned green, down you went. As I approached the ground, and you go down pretty quickly, there was a house. I missed the house, and then there was a tree coming at me the other way. But between the house and the tree, the, the wind dropped. I hit the ground and I took off my parachute quickly. And two women came out of the dark. They were on the reception committee. And oh, they were so thrilled. And so it was just as excited as I was, actually. <laughs> Al Sirwa's mission is to set up a radio link with London, arrange for the drop of weapons and supplies, and help prepare a resistance uprising to coincide with the Allied invasion. He makes his way to the city of Angoulême, heavily garrisoned by the Germans, to meet his organizer, Charles Reschenmann. He knew the lay of the land, he was a Frenchman, you know, he knew the country, and they had tremendous confidence in him. Altogether, we did 24 drops in, in, in that area, 24. Nothing would go wrong with Charles, you know, nothing wrong. That's how you felt with him. In mid-May, Charles Reschenman has a meeting in a restaurant with a local member of his network, René Boccaro. All of a sudden, the table is surrounded by uh, Gestapo agents, and they started questioning him. They said, do you have any parcels with you, any suitcase? And they said, no. But a little, a little maid who said, oh, yes, they did, they did. It's in, I'll give it to you. So she went and got a suitcase, but there was a revolver in there and a pile of money. So that was the end of Charles. Charles Reschenmann refuses to talk and is imprisoned by the Gestapo. But René Boccaro, desperate to save his own life, turns double agent. He told the Germans that he was, he was going to get me to work for them, you see. Once, once he had me as a prisoner, they may have tried to use me. So I wired London, I, I said, look, I said, this fellow's after me. I said, uh, uh, what do you suggest? They said, you do what you think is best. And we I did. We had some people who uh, took care of these, these, these characters and uh, it was his life or mine. When you're working in that type of thing, there's only one law, the law of the gun. Though the Germans know who he is and are hunting for him, Al Sirwa stays in France and continues to organize supply drops. They told us, look, if things go wrong in your territory, you're not coming back because the invasion is coming. Move somewhere else, but keep on working. Around two o'clock in the morning, we said, ooh, ooh, ooh plane was coming. He started dropping the, the, dropping the parachutes. And the minute he was gone, we had to get busy. There were 250 pound containers. So we were walking back home. And we said, well, we sure pulled a going on him tonight. All of a sudden, we, click, click. The German patrol come, coming straight for us. 
You could see the, the, the moon shining on their, on their helmets. My friends, we're cooked. They said, no, let's run, let's run. Like two scared rabbits, turn off. There was a little bush there. And you know, at night you hear, you hear a, a crack, and branches crack. You thought we were there. So they opened up with everything they had. We were crawling like devils, getting away from them. It was the experience of a lifetime, actually. And I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. And I was very lucky to get away with it. Al Sirwa successfully continues his operations in France until the liberation. But many agents are not so fortunate. In the spring of 1944, the Germans continue using captured radios and codes to fool London into parachuting dozens of SOE operatives directly into the hands of the Gestapo. By March 1944, the Germans had been playing the radio game for 10 months. London had made dozens of drops of money and weapons and even agents directly into German hands, and they're finally getting suspicious. So they contacted Paris and said, we want to talk to Frank Pickersgill. Of course, the Germans panicked because Pickersgill had been sent to a concentration camp months before, and they had no idea if he was still alive. They did manage to find him, and they brought him here, 3B Place Etats Unis, Gestapo Torture Chambers. Pickersgill was taken to the third floor, where he's politely asked to talk to London on the S-phone, basically to become a traitor. And although he was emaciated and very weakened by the time in the concentration camp, he became enraged. He grabbed a bottle, broke it, ran out into the hallway and attacked two German guards, killing one with a broken bottle. He came down the stairs to the second floor, then leaped out onto the sidewalk and started running towards Ruelena. The German guards started shooting at him and hit him four times. And he stumbled and fell. He got up again, staggered on, but couldn't go any further. His courageous act ended the radio game and saved the lives of many agents. Frank Pickersgill miraculously survives and is imprisoned with many other captured SOE agents. As he recovers the moment all the agents have fought so bravely for, the Allied invasion, the beginning of the liberation, has arrived. By June 1944, most of the captured SOE agents were held in Paris. And of course, they heard about the D-Day landings. What they had fought for and what they had sacrificed for was now at hand. On August 25th, 1944, the Allied armies rolled into Paris and the city went crazy. But the prisoners weren't here anymore. They had been shipped to Germany. And their files were marked NN, knocked in Neville, night in fog, return not required. Just two weeks before the liberation of Paris, Frank Pickersgill, John McAllister, Charles Reschenman, and 35 other SOE prisoners are transported to Buchenwald concentration camp. As Allied armies liberate France, a special train carries 38 captured SOE agents deep into Germany, towards Buchenwald concentration camp. One of those agents is Jo Thomas. When we got to Buchenwald, we were told it was one of the worst concentration camps. 
Someone pointed out a squat black chimney just beyond the block and said that's the crematorium. It's the surest of all escape routes. Most of us will only get out of this camp by coming through that chimney as smoke. This loathsome place is Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany. More than 50,000 people died here in the most deplorable conditions. And it's a grim reminder why we fought the Second World War. Frank Pickersgill would square his shoulders and sing. Others seemed too tired, but seeing his example, they joined in. He was always trying to keep other people's spirits up. He was a very brave man. On September 9th, the blow fell. Over the camp loudspeaker came the announcement. The following prisoners from Block 17 must report to the tower immediately. McAllister. Rationman, Pickersgill, in all, 16 of our comrades. The men were escorted from the clock tower to this building, which is the crematorium, and they knew what that meant. They were going to be murdered. They stood around in this room and watched as each of their friends would be put up on the ladder with a piece of piano wire around their neck and hung from these hooks like a carcass. It must have been terrible as one by one, each of their friends were put up and suffered and then they had to wait their turn. These were very brave men and they deserved a far better fate. And so died Frank Pickersgill, John McAllister, Romeo Sabarin, Reed Ragger. As the Allied armies advance on Germany, the Nazis are facing imminent defeat, and they systematically eliminate their special prisoners. In Dachau, Yulan de Beekman and Nur Inyat Khan are shot in the back of the neck, executed with seven other female agents. This is what remains of Flossenburg concentration camp. It's located in northern Bavaria near the Czech border, and it was a major labor encampment during the Second World War. But there was a secret camp within the camp, and here, high-profile prisoners of the German Reich were kept. This area was once a block of isolation cells where these prisoners were kept in solitary confinement. And on Easter Sunday, 1944, Gustav Bieler came through these gates. Gustav Bieler, the legendary Commandant Guy, endured months of torture in Paris, but still never talked. And so he earned himself an isolation cell at Flossenburg, among the most dangerous enemies of the Nazis. This is the secret isolation cell block, and at one time it contained 40 isolation cells. But today, only to remain. You can see the door here. You have the eye hole. And of course, this is where the dinner would be put through. And you can see how small it is. Solitary confinement was its own form of torture. The Germans would seal off these windows so the prisoner was in complete darkness 24 hours a day. They were fed irregularly and were literally starving. The guards were sadistic here. They'd come in and beat the men for no reason. What's amazing is their spirit still remained. They'd communicate through these walls using Morse code. After a few months of this, the SS came to cell number 23 and Gustav Bieler was taken away. The 
the SS brought Beeler down these stairs past the crematorium into the area known as the Valley of Death. He was marched across to a shooting post where he was tied and blindfolded. They read out the charges against him, which was sabotage, and he was shot. Gustav Bieler was a great man. He came to Europe in his darkest hours, and he brought hope that liberation would someday come. In the end, he won. It's just sad he did not live to see the day. On May 7, 1945, Germany surrenders. The war in Europe is over. In the end, he succeeded. In the end, we, uh, we got rid of the, of the menace, the world menace. And uh, certainly, it was worth it. Certainly. Certainly. That's the cost of freedom, when you have to give up your life. But it's a life well spent. Well spent. It was worth every everything you gave for it. <laughs>